Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Fabio Panetta, candidate for the position of uh, member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. Um, ECB executive board member Benoit Coiré will leave his functions by December 31st, uh, 2019, after a term of office of eight years. In accordance with Article 283.2 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the European Parliament is consulted on the Council's recommendation on the appointment of the Executive Board members of the European Central Bank. On October 16, 2019, the European Council consulted Parliament on the appointment of Fabio Panetta for a term of office of eight years, with effect from January 1, 2020. Ahead of today's public hearing, the candidate has received a written questionnaire of 54 questions. The replies by the candidate are annexed, uh, annexed to the draft report on the appointment of a member of the executive board of the ECB. The hearing uh, will be followed by a vote at uh, 5 p.m. today. The Econ Committee will then submit a proposal for a European Parliament decision on the Council's recommendation regarding Mr. Panetta's nomination as candidate for the position of executive board member of the European Central Bank, which is planned to be taken at the plenary sitting of 16th, 19th of December. Uh, at the beginning of the hearing, the candidate will make a brief introductory statement of 10 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. So, Mr. Panetta, I leave you the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everybody. In reading my opening statement, uh, I will skip some, uh, uh, skip some paragraphs that you will find in the written version to stay within the time limit. Madam Chair, honorable members of the European Parliament, it is a honor for me to appear before this committee. This is a key step in the process of my appointment to the executive board of the European Central Bank. I'm firmly convinced that accountability and transparency to the people and their representatives is necessary to a central bank's effectiveness and legitimacy. I will first recall my relevant professional qualifications. I will then share my views on what is needed to successfully carry out the ECB tasks. I will also touch upon some of the challenges that lie ahead. I have been a central banker for my entire professional life. I joined the Bank of Italy in 1985 and became board member in 2012. I'm now setting to, uh, sen senior deputy governor and chairman of Italy's Insurance Supervisory Authority. I have been, a <coughs> sorry, at the European level, I have actively contributed to the establishment of the banking union as a member of the supervisory board of the single supervisory mechanism since its creation. I'm also member of the general board of the European Systemic Risk Board. In the ECB Governing Council, I have been a company person and then alternate member since the early 2000s. This has given me the privilege of experiencing the momentous initial years of the single monetary policy and the challenging period of the financial and sovereign debt crisis. In international fora, I have observed firsthand the importance of international cooperation. I have always been aware that our actions as central bankers do not take place in a vacuum. Rather, they have a deep impact on people's lives, on their purchasing power, on their income, on their work, and on the security of their savings and pensions. Within the limits of our mandate, it is our duty to strive to improve across all those dimensions. Based on my experience, I would like to stress the main principles that, in my view, should inspire the ECB's actions in the years to come. Commitment to the price stability mandate, a sound data-driven approach, clear and transparent communication, and fostering financial stability. Maintaining price stability is the greatest contribution monetary policy can make to the prosperity of the euro area. This is the core of its mandate. This has been confirmed of, by what happened during the crisis when the euro area faced the unprecedented peril that a prolonged period of too low inflation could eventually degenerate into a deflationary spiral. Risks to price stability went hand in hand with poor growth, low employment, stagnating wages and 
threats to financial stability. The ECB successfully met the challenges. The measures adopted by the Governing Council prevented the materialization of deflationary risks, stopping the downward deterioration in inflation expectations. Experience indicates that it is essential to act proactively before deflationary developments lead economic agents to postpone purchases and investments and become harder to combat and eradicate. Fending off deflation thus supported growth and employment. The euro area economy is still facing headwinds coming from global tensions and protectionist policies, which are weakening economic activity and threatening price stability. It is important to continue acting with determination against these risks. At the same time, we must be constantly alert to the possible uh, unintended consequences of monetary policy, especially in the area of financial stability. A high level of vigilance is necessary to detect any such consequences as early as possible. Macroprudential tools are available and should be used to address any undesirable developments. Monetary policy cannot follow a preset course. Central bankers must be pragmatic and data-driven, receptive to everything that may emerge from the constant flow of information. My background as an empirical economist and my experience at the Bank of Italy have taught me the value of an approach that rests on an open-minded appraisal of all available evidence. Let me quote the former Bank of Italy governor and former president of the Italian Republic, Ciampi, a great European, who said that acquiring knowledge, comparing evidence, and grappling with doubts prepares and enriches the moment of decision-taking, end of quotation. Open-mindedness means that instruments must be used in a flexible way, but always in accordance with the mandate. When new tools may cause undesirable side effects, vigilance must be at peak levels. At this juncture, the benefits from the ECB policies still outweigh their potential side effects. This, however, is no justification for complacency. Clear and transparent communication is necessary for monetary policy to work as intended. It enhances the effectiveness of central banks' actions by orienting market reactions and people's behavior and expectations. It, also, it is also a prerequisite so that central banks can be held accountable by democratically elected bodies. This is especially the case in exceptional times when unconventional measures must be explained to the public with clarity and with constant reference to the price stability mandate. Since the start of the crisis, the Bank of Italy strengthened its interaction with and accountability to Parliament. Since 2014, the Board has appeared in 38 hearings. Moreover, we have engaged in an extensive program to reach out to all areas of society. I have personally participated in meetings with people in various Italian cities to discuss our policy and those of the Euro system. This improved people's understanding and their trust. The ECB has key responsibilities reading, regarding financial stability, not least because financial stability is a precondition for price stability. As a member of the supervisory board, I was involved in dealing with the extraordinarily negative legacy of the crisis. Now, six years after the creation of the single supervisory mechanism, the euro area banking system is more resilient, more capitalized, and better equipped to withstand adverse shocks. In Italy, the stock of net non-performing loans is at 4%, less than half of the peak value of 2015. Risks may now be accumulating for some non-bank intermediaries, highly leveraged firms and real estate sectors. This requires close monitoring and targeted macroprudential policies. To foster the euro area's resilience in case of future shocks, further progress is necessary on the banking union, including its third pillar, the Common Deposit Insurance Scheme, and on the Capital Markets Union. Delivering on these two projects is fundamental to improve the functioning of the Economic and Monetary Union. Moving to the challenges ahead, the digital transformation is changing people's lives. 
The adoption of technology in finance must be encouraged so that cheaper, faster, and secure services increase competition and financial inclusion, thereby enhancing people's welfare. However, this also poses challenges. While some of them, such as consumer protection, fall outside the ECB mandate, central banks are no doubt crucial for facilitating a smooth transition to the payment landscape of the future. Central banks themselves are adopting the new technologies. The Bank of Italy has started using machine learning and big data technologies some years ago. These are now used, among other things, to improve macroeconomic forecasting, identify anomalous transactions for anti-money laundering purposes, compute real-time risk indicators. The entry of big players in the financial sector and the possible adoption of global digital currencies create challenges for banks, for tax compliance, for consumers and privacy protection, for combating money laundering and terrorism financing, and ultimately for monetary policy and financial stability. This requires enhanced cooperation among public authorities, including central banks. The report on global digital currencies by the working group of the G7 deputies, of which I have been a member, provides in-depth analysis and lines for future action. Climate change is a threat to growth and prosperity, and there is increasing awareness of its impact on monetary policy making and financial stability. In this respect, central banks have an important role to play, and they can and must do their share to address climate risks. At the Bank of Italy, we are moving in this direction. As chairman of the investment committee, I have steered our investment policy towards integrating these concerns into the allocation of our equity portfolio, excluding companies that do not satisfy the criteria of the UN Global Compact and giving preference to firms with high ESG scores. We participate in all the work streams of the Network for the Greening of the Financial System and in national and international technical groups. The availability of an objective and widely adopted taxonomy of green activities can broaden the market for related securities, allowing central banks and to steer their asset allocation in ways that are attentive to environmental and social issues. Central banks can be a catalyst for the investment policies of the private sector. They can and should encourage financial intermediaries to integrate climate-related risks and social considerations in their policies. We have to promote and emphasize the benefits of diverse and inclusive decision-making. In a world that is diverse and interconnected, research shows that diverse teams and inclusive behavior enable organizations to achieve better performance. We must address multiple facets of diversity. Diversity of thinking, culture, and first and foremost, gender diversity. The Bank of Italy started tackling gender diversity years ago by adopting multi-year strategic plans and creating a diversity manager responsible for promoting inclusion policies and women's professional growth. The introduction of smart working and the availability of childcare structures contributed to ensuring work-life balance, especially, but not only, for women. The introduction of mentorship programs and a balanced gender composition of panels reduced implicit discrimination. The results are tangible. 30% of the managers are now women, up from half that figure only a few years ago. We are ahead of our target of 35% by 2022 and will keep improving thereafter. For Italy's Insurance Supervisory Authority, of which I am the chair, the share of women in managerial positions is 50%. Gender parity in terms of representation in the ranks and voices in the room is also what the ECB should strive for. Let me conclude by saying that I have seen how engaged this committee is with the issues I mentioned. Scrutiny by the European Parliament provides a bedrock of accountability that is essential to the ECB's effectiveness and legitimacy. 
I believe that my economic and financial expertise and experience can make a useful contribution to the pursuit of the ECB's mission, including the emerging challenges. As you are the representatives of European citizens, I would be immensely honored to receive your support for appointment to the ECB's executive board and thus to be able to further contribute to building a stronger, more inclusive and more equitable Europe. Thank you. I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we open our Q&A session. Um, the usual rules apply of uh, five minutes uh, for each slot. And uh, we start with uh, Markus Ferber from EPP. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Panetta, I'll be speaking my mother tongue, if you'll allow me. Now, in your statement, you said that instruments need to be used in a flexible manner. You also talked about unconventional measures. So that brings me to a question. Now, until the 31st uh, of December, well, you won't be in office then, but, but basically, are we, pre are we prepared for the crisis case? Mrs. Lagarde said there's no uh, bans on uh, thinking about the future policies of the ECB. So what do you actually mean by new instruments? Do you mean the purchase of assets, uh, helicopter money, abolishing cash? Do you have other ideas in the back of your mind? Well, first of all, thank you for your question, uh, uh, which touches indeed a very important point. Well, uh, I was referring to <clears throat> the ECB has shifted in order to bring inflation back in line with the uh, 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 inflation aim of the governing council, that is inflation of close but below 2%. Uh, it shifted from uh, standard policy measures to non-standard policy measures, the asset purchase program, negative interest rates. And uh, this was a necessity. This was something which was required by the outlook for inflation by in, uh, during the crisis years by the need to uh, contrast the risk of a deflationary spiral and now by the risk of a prolonged period of low uh, inflation. I'm not thinking of any uh, 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 fancy uh, instrument, helicopter money, I'm not thinking of anything like that. I'm thinking of the need to use uh, all the tools which are available and which are within the mandate of the European Central Banks in order to preserve price uh, stability. Um, let, let me say that, you know, let, let's uh, uh, think uh, uh, of what the situation was 10 years ago. Who could have imagined back then that uh, uh, at this stage uh, the ECB would be buying bonds, that n n nominal rates would be, policy rates would be uh, negative, or even in other uh, economic regions that the Federal Reserve could have started a program such, such as the TARP program, or that in Japan the central bank could start a, a qualitative and quantitative easing buying also shares of uh, 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 financial and non-financial companies. This is not something which we are in, uh, in the governing council is envisaging, but it's an example of the need to take measures which are proportionate and which are necessary to uh, preserve price stability. Well, can I ask you a follow-up question? Thank you for that. Now, the last monetary policy decision of the ECB was uh, by Mario Draghi. He said it was no point having a vote. But it's realized afterwards that the majorities were not as clear as he had assumed. And there's been quite a lot of resistance from a series of different member states to those last policy decisions. How do you think the decision-making process in the ECB could be improved? And where do you see your role in that process? <clears throat> uh, I was not uh, in the meeting of the Governing Council when the decision was taken, so I will respond to you based on uh, uh, public information. The information that I got from 
<coughs> the public discussion and from what the, uh, uh, the president of the ECB uh, said yesterday uh, would indicate that there was a um, consensus, unanimity on the need to take uh, expansionary measures. I understand the discussion was on how to calibrate each individual measure. Um, uh, so the disagreement is probably uh, less uh, acute than one uh, might imagine from uh, reading the press. Uh, on top of that, I, in my experience, I have participated to previous meetings of the Governing Council, and uh, uh, the meetings of the Governing Council uh, start with a very careful and very uh, uh, detailed presentation of economic developments at the global level, economic developments in uh, the euro area, financial developments, the status of uh, financial markets, uh, and uh, the decision-making process, process is uh, uh, quite uh, careful, uh, it's uh, very technical, it's quite rich of information, and uh, in general, uh, um, I think that the, the Governing Council member considered the information and the decision-making process itself uh, quite uh, appropriate. Of course, uh, uh, in a board that is uh, uh, composed of 25 members, I think one should not be surprised is if, uh, especially in uh, uh, peculiar situations like the current one in which uh, the ECB has adopted a, a package of measures which are <clears throat> uh, not in the standard toolkit of central banks, uh, there could be uh, different views. But I think that the decision-making process is quite efficient and uh, up to now uh, the, uh, the, the governing councils, council has always been able to take decisions and to act in a timely fashion whenever necessary. Thank you very much. And now, Jonas Fernandez from SMB. Buenos dias. Good morning. Welcome to you, Mr. Panetta. I have two questions for you. As you know, there's a debate academically now which is relevant on the development of uh, natural interest rates, where there seems to be a perceived constant fall. Uh, in these balancing interest rates. And in the context of the framework review of monetary policy that the Parliament asked for in Mrs. Lagarde's hearing and that she formally announced yesterday here, in the context of that, I'd like to know uh, to what extent this revision of natural interest rates could lead to a review of uh, the possible uh, inflation objective that you have as well. Secondly, now we're all concerned, and you said you were concerned, about the lateral effects of the current monetary policy. And I'd like to ask you about the ESRB, the Systemic Risk Board. Could it have a more relevant role when it comes to designing macroprudential policies? that would seek to try to uh, dispel these lateral effects as much as possible. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Well, uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, as the chair announced, the uh, 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 governing council of the ECB will be discussing its uh, uh, monetary policy uh, strategy. And uh, in this revision, uh, the approach would be a broad one and the uh, discussions will be open-minded. And uh, all uh, different uh, elements of the monetary policy strategy will be taken into account. Uh, you are right. In the academic literature, one of the few things on which economists agree is that the natural rate is decreasing. And this is naturally due, due to demographic uh, uh, trends, uh, uh, low productivity growth, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, savings uh, glut, the uh, excess savings over uh, investment. And this has a, a in the, there are papers uh, which would suggest that uh, uh, in response to a reduction of the uh, natural rate, you should adjust your inflation target. And as always, uh, the economists are two-handed. Some papers suggest you should reduce, some papers suggest that you should increase the inflation target. This is something that will be uh, discussed by the governing council with a with the support of the staff, which have very good uh, uh, analytical skills, and with the support of uh, outside uh, academics, uh, uh, members of uh, uh, the society uh, at large,
charge, and I'm sure that this uh, and many other uh, elements will be discussed to review the um, <coughs> monetary policy uh, strategy. On, on your uh, second uh, question, uh, <coughs> yes, there are side effects, uh, possible side effects uh, 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 stemming from the uh, unconventional policy measures, and I think that these side effects have been uh, uh, detected by the um, the ESRB quite carefully. The ESRB has uh, uh, issued warnings uh, in a timely fashion in a number of occasions. For example, the overheating of the housing market in uh, some uh, member states has been uh, uh, very clearly uh, identified and uh, you know, uh, um, uh, analyzed by the ESRB. I think that uh, uh, there are now in the Euro area 13 countries which have taken macroprudential measures to um, cope with the increase of house prices in some cases and excess increase relative to relative to fundamentals so and those warnings were uh, largely driven those measures macroprudential measures were largely driven by the warnings of the ESRB so i think the ESRB has played a key role uh, it will probably uh, um, um, remain a very important uh, 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 forum to examine the macro potential and the financial stability effects of policies at large. And uh, I think it has, up to now, provided a very useful contribution to uh, macro potential policies in uh, the Euro area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Monica Semedo from Renew. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Panetta. Last week, uh, the European Parliament uh, adopted uh, the resolution on the climate emergency with a, a broad majority, an important signal to our citizens, but also to EU institutions, that there needs to be urgent actions. And, and now uh, there's an evaluation of the uh, currency strategy, and uh, monetary strategy. And um, uh, Mrs. Lagarde said yesterday that uh, climate considerations will be included. And uh, this is something that you mentioned in your statement as well. Um, from your point of view, uh, digitalization and um, climate effects, what about a, a possible ECB currency? Are these things that should be taken into about? Because it appears that people on the board uh, agree with this and uh, th th but the, in some other areas there seems to be more focus on monetary considerations i i have captured two questions <clears throat> uh the first one uh, is on the uh, relationship between the activity of the ecb and climate change well, the uh, ECB has three uh, functions. Uh, the the uh, most relevant one is uh, the uh, <clears throat> objective of maintaining price stability. Then it is entrusted with uh, microprudential uh, supervision, and uh, uh, third is the the. the uh, financial stability role of the ECB, the uh, role in preserving financial stability. I think that in uh, each of these roles, the uh, ECB uh, could uh, give a very important uh, contribution to uh, the analysis and the uh, 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 um, contrast of climate change risks. In uh, uh, microprudential supervision, uh, uh, the ECB, the SSM, uh, the single supervisory mechanism, is already uh, 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 starting a discussion uh, with banks in order to induce them to take climate change into consideration when, when they assess the risks uh, which, they, uh, which banks uh, have on their balance sheets. If they don't do that, they might, might be uh, underestimating the risks they are uh, bearing, and uh, uh, of course, uh, it would be uh, much better if they uh, took with a medium term uh, horizon uh, into account uh, the risk of climate changes. Uh, financial stability is also affected by climate change. Think, for example, of the effect of natural uh, disasters on financial intermediaries such as insurance companies, and this might have very uh, broad effects, which 
could eventually affect uh, financial stability. And again, in its uh, financial stability role, the ECB should take into account uh, the effect of climate changes. And third, for monetary policy, uh, climate risk might affect monetary policy both in the, in the short run because it changes the frequency and the distribution of the shocks which hit the economy. Think, for example, of the possible effect of a very cold winter on the construction sector, as it happened a few years ago in Germany. Uh, we made wrong forecasts on the uh, short-run growth of the euro, euro area economy because in Germany and other northern countries the winter impeded uh, work in the construction sector or in the medium term. Think for example to the possible effect of uh, uh, the transition in the uh, uh, carbon intensive sectors which have to readjust, which have to shrink probably and this might have uh, an impact on the functioning of the economy and uh, uh, possibly on the, the medium-term inflation expectations. So the main contribution that the ECB could give to uh, <clears throat> the uh, environmental uh, uh, um, um, issue is to uh, facilitate the pricing of climate risk, of climate change, or the risk of climate change. In this way, not only the ECB, but also the financial sector at large would be contributing to finance uh, projects which are attentive to environmental uh, issues. Uh, there is also the possibility for the central bank to invest its own uh, money and uh, uh, to buy uh, uh, securities which uh, are uh, um, uh, environment friendly, the so-called uh, so green bonds, uh, but in this case you require a very careful analysis because you take, must take into account the need uh, to be market uh, neutral. Uh, I uh, think that the, the role of the ECB and central banks at large will likely uh, expand in this uh, uh, type of investment uh, as long as the market develops. That is, as long as the volume of outstanding green bonds will uh, increase. Uh, looking at some numbers, now uh, there are, according to the estimates by the Bank for International Settlements, outstanding amounts of green bonds which are worth 700 billion euros. Of this, only 250 billion euros are in, in, uh, uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, let's assume that half of that portfolio is owned by buy and hold investors. There's only more than, slightly more than 100 billion uh, green bonds available. The uh, uh, APP portfolio of the uh, Euro system is 2.6 trillion. So if, uh, if the ECB were to buy only were to allocate only 5% uh, of that portfolio to the green bonds, it would swallow up the market. So uh, we cannot engage too much into this uh, business of buying, investing in green uh, uh, securities. We have to be um, progressive. We don't want to make the market illiquid. We do not want to make it impossible for private investors to trade and price the risk of climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Jake Lunas from the Greens. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Panetta, uh, these are important challenges you are describing and answering to the questions, but uh, let's try to go a little deeper into the banking system. Would you agree that, uh, you know, fractional reserve banking model is the core issue and problem which uh, has been not resolved and it's expanding? Uh, the resulting uh, money creation and de facto monetary policy because of that is in private hands to a large extent, I, I wouldn't say fully, but to a large extent, structural maturity mismatches uh, in the balance sheet of the banking system is a prevailing issue because banks need to refinance by short-term deposits when money leaves uh, the banking system. Uh, size of the banking system uh, in some countries uh, at, uh, you know, several times of GDP. Uh, uh, the globalization of the banking system and the uh, financial system in general, uh, coupled with the previous deregulation, massive deregulation, uh, and, uh, you know, innovation or so-called innovations, the products and uh, in the sale methods, are the core issues, at least to my mind, uh, that uh, caused this uh, crisis, and not, not only this crisis, but uh, earlier crisis as well to a large extent. 
What is your opinion about these uh, statements? And if you agree, at least to a certain extent, uh, are these changes in the uh, banking union, in the uh, mechanisms that have been created, which are, of course, welcome, enough to uh, deal with these uh, core challenges and core fragilities, or are they to stay with us for years to come, unless some uh, changes uh, happen? For example, central bank uh, digital currency is a project which is very interesting with serious implications or potential serious implications. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. Well, uh, uh, it is true that the uh, uh, fractional uh, reserve uh, banking model uh, is inherently unstable, and it was due to excessive leverage that uh, you know, prevailed before the financial crisis. Uh, after the crisis, after Lehman, uh, the international regulatory uh, community has reacted to that, and a number of uh, new uh, laws and regulations have been introduced, and the uh, supervisory approach uh, has changed, I would say, at the global uh, level. Um, there have been uh, measures which have been taken to address each and every of the issues you have mentioned. For example, the mismatch of maturities. Now banks have uh, liquidity ratios uh, which should uh, you know, uh, protect the bank uh, from potential illiquidity of the markets when they have to roll over their uh, liabilities. Uh, now the uh, capital regulation of banks has changed. It's, it is much more prudent and conservative than it used to be. Uh, a leverage uh, uh, ratio uh, has been introduced with a ceiling on the uh, uh, sides of the total assets of the bank, unweighted, uh, total assets of the banks uh, relative to their capital uh, uh, stock. So uh, there are uh, um, issues, but these issues have been uh, addressed after the financial crisis. Uh, in the euro area, the reaction to the financial crisis has been uh, very vibrant. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, started the banking union project. The single supervisory mechanism, which, which is the first pillar, is up and running, and the results and the uh, benefits of the single supervision have become visible uh, already. I mentioned in my introduction the reduction of the MPL, uh, the ratio of non-performing loans uh, to total uh, banking assets in Italy, but also in the euro area at large, in the euro area at large, the MPA ratio has decreased. Banks have deleveraged the, the, the size of the total assets of banks in the euro area relative to GDP has decreased uh, substantially, and a number of other uh, safeguards have been introduced to uh, keep the risk of the banking system in check. The second pillar has also been launched, the uh, single resolution mechanism. The single resolution board is uh, operational and now is uh, uh, active. The, it has already uh, intervened in a number of banking crises and uh, up to now the process uh, has been working quite well. There is discussion, as you know, on the third pillar, which should uh, 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 <clears throat> introduce a, a single deposit guarantee scheme. The discussion is now ongoing, and I really welcome the uh, restart of the uh, 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 discussion at the European level, which uh, um, uh, will likely follow after the German non paper on uh, the uh, banking uh, uh, union. Uh, going forward, there are other safeguards which will be uh, put at work, the backstop for the single resolution fund, uh, the introduction of the Basel III uh, regulation, and a number of other uh, international, the TLAC uh, uh, regulation for the global systemic uh, uh, banks. So other uh, safeguards are being introduced, and this uh, should, uh, uh, I cannot say eliminate, but uh, keep under control the risk which could stem from the banking system for the real economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Antonio Rinaldi from ID. Grazie. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Fabio uh, Panetta, you have excellent professional experience, but for many years at the top of one of the most prestigious Italian institutions, that's to say the Bank of Italy, You've supported 
Uh, well, you've been supported in your uh, approach to uh, your attempt to become a member of the executive board of the ECB. But I've got three questions for you. As for the ESM questions, don't you think that these should fall under the e ECB? These kind of issues are covered by central banks pretty much everywhere around the world. It's a question of uh, the sovereignty of countries. Surely there should be uh, involvement of the ECB there. And at the, w the moment, we see this at the mercy of the rating agencies. Now, the bank has to do its... Uh, 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 well, if the ECB is to act in a timely and effective manner, then it needs to ensure the sustainability of debt of the member state concerned. So what this means is basically having a risk weighting for public debt, the effect of which could be devastating when it comes to market expectations and the clear conflict of interest, because the ECB is an uh, issuing central bank. The uh, country reports issued by the Commission each year is uh, uh, going to be a, a kind of rating, isn't it? Then secondly, the former President Draghi could, uh, talked about continuing the uh, quantitative easing uh, and other unconventional measures. Do you plan to continue that? Thirdly, do you think it's right that the European institutions should use fairer rules to deal with uh, strictly commercial banks and those which are uh, in more like investment banks, particularly the ones dealing with level three assets? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your. Uh, should I answer in Italian or in English? Uh, well, maybe I answer in English because I want. Uh, uh, first of all, on the uh, ESM uh, treaty, um, I think that the I view the ESM treaty as uh, uh, a way of uh, defining the legal basis for the operations of the ESM and for the governance of the uh, ESM, of the institution. Uh, I do not see major changes in the current formulation of the treaty relative to the uh, previous one. And uh, uh, I see the ESM as a sort of insurance policy. That is an insurance which, uh, um, well, such as the car insurance policy that we all buy, hoping that we will never make use of it. And, uh, uh, we, of course, hope we will never have an accident and we hope we will never use the ESM. And uh, uh, the ESM uh, treaty that is being considered right now uh, is intended to uh, reinforce the crisis management framework of the euro area. And this is the object objective of the proposals which are now under discussion. And I think that this is a good time to introduce such a, a, a framework because there is no country uh, which is uh, undergoing tensions, financial tensions, uh, no country with uh, an uh, EDP uh, uh, procedure, uh, no sovereign is in stress conditions. Uh, Euro area member state, states can, the sovereigns can access the financial markets at very easy conditions in a uh, number of cases with uh, negative rates up to very long maturities. Uh, there is no country which uh, I can think of right now which seems to be in need of accessing the ESM. So uh, overall, this seems to be a, a good time to buy an insurance uh, policy. On your second uh, uh, question on the non-standard measures, I agree to the extent that the non-standard measures are necessary to preserve, uh, uh, to maintain price uh, stability. Up to now, the uh, assessment of the governing council is that the inflation outlook is not in line with its uh, inflation aim of close but below 2%. Uh, de facto, the governing council has uh, indicated that 1.5% uh, in 2021 is not satisfactory to uh, uh, 
uh, preserve price stability in the medium term, so the uh, recourse to the non-standard measures is uh, considered uh, useful and uh, necessary, and this is the reason why the Governing Council took the measures uh, that you know very well in September. To the extent that this will remain the situation, uh, the Governing Council will certainly continue to act in a decisive way, and the non-standard measures will be part of the uh, possible tools that it, would, uh, it could activate. On uh, uh, banks, uh, I'm in favor of keeping in check all risks, credit risks, operational risks, market risks, uh, uh, AML, uh, uh, money laundering risks, uh, and uh, certainly all risks should be under control by the uh, single supervisory mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Raffaele Fitto from ECR. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, for those who've had a look at the CV and experience of Dr. Panetta, you'll be aware that he is a good guarantee of competence faced with the kind of topics we're facing. I've got a couple of questions for you, following on from the debate that we had yesterday with the president of the ECB. She announced the start of a review of uh, ECB's monetary policy do you feel that this is an appropriate and necessary uh, uh, review? If you are nominated, will you use your experience in this strategic review and could you give us some more specific examples of the kind of uh, ideas that might orientate this review? Secondly, in your answer on non-performing loans, you say that the problem with the banking sector is its low levels of revenue generation. What kind of medicine can you apply? You're suggesting that we need uh, risk reduction policies, and how would that function? Thank you very much for your questions. Well, on the first question, you're asking about the review of the monetary policy strategy. The review certainly has to consider all of the factors that have changed over the course of the last 15, indeed 16 years since the previous review took place. In the meantime, what has fundamentally changed is the uh, structure of the financial market. Intermediation by banks and non-banks has changed. The manner in which banks operate has changed significantly. And non-bank intermediaries have become much more prevalent. We're going through a period of low growth. Uh, the, uh, with a very low natural uh, interest rate has been mentioned, and that influences the uh, way that monetary policy works. A number of countries have launched into so-called non-standard measures, to the point that these have become virtually standard measures. So the monetary policy environment has changed fundamentally in the meantime. So I think that we really do need to look at the optimal uh, mix of policies to allow us to ensure price stability, preserve price stability. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Yes, I, I, in, the, in the answers to the questionnaire, I emphasized that the main uh, problem of the European banking sector is the low profitability. Uh, the risks uh, that were uh, um, you know, affecting the banking sector after the financial crisis have been to a large extent addressed. Not everything has been uh, uh, done, not all problems have been solved, but the, you know, the, 
main systemic issues have been addressed by the single supervisory mechanism. Take the MPR ratio. At the euro area level, the MPR ratio has decreased by almost 50%. In the high MPL countries, the reduction of the non-performing loans ratio has been even uh, more profound. So I think that the, there are issues to address. There is market risk which needs to be addressed. We are now seeing more and more cases of money laundering issues in European banks, and we know that uh, the risk of money laundering is a pernicious illness which can kill a bank in a matter of hours or uh, days. Um, we now have to stimulate bank profitability. The, I, in my view, the main issue uh, which is affecting bank profitability is the fact that there is an excess capacity in the European banking system which is uh, you know, influencing the activity of banks. There is uh, much discussion on how to address this. Uh, of course, consolidation is one way. Uh, you stimulate consolidation, especially cross-border, so that there is no uh, competition issue or lower competition issues, and you can have, you know, enjoy the benefits of scale economies once you consolidate cross-border without having the problems of uh, uh, excessive market power. But uh, I think that consolidation uh, cannot be the uh, uh, solution to everything. Banks have to face the challenge of uh, technology. They are facing now competition, especially in uh, uh, the provision of uh, specific uh, services such as payments, asset management, by the so-called fintech companies. That is, companies that use in, uh, intensively technology to provide their services at low cost in a much more efficient way. So uh, banks have to cope with this problem as well. But uh, then, uh, in order to uh, address the issue of overcapacity, I think that we have to think thoroughly and uh, carefully on how to uh, accompany the banks which do not have a business case out of the market in a way that is not too painful, not for the bank which has to exit the market, but for the others, for the neighbors. So without externalities which could affect uh, the functioning of the banking market. We have uh, a way to address uh, uh, banking crisis and the liquidation of banks within the BRRD um, bail-in uh, framework, but this, as you know, applies only to a handful of banks, 50, 60 banks in the euro area, those banks which uh, would pass the public interest test. For all the others, and we have almost 4,000 banks in the euro area, uh, the liquidation and the exit for the market uh, uh, apart from consolidation is more complicated and this is another issue that we have to address in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Jose Guzmao from GUE. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will speak in Portuguese. Um, what I wanted to know is that when you go on to the strategic review, will you be dealing with the issue of the combination of monetary policy with other economic policies, particularly fiscal policy. I'm asking this because it's rather disconcerting to note the way we seem to be thinking about more and more creative monetary policies without having a balanced combination of policies, particularly fiscal policies at the national and European level, that could, well, better share the uh, effort to try and get some growth going. What I have heard when I've asked central bankers is that, oh, fiscal policy is outside the ECB mandate. Well, there's two problems encapsulated within this. First of all, the ECB has never had any problem when it comes to calling for restrictive fiscal policies, including in periods when it was breaching its mandate in periods of uh, excessively low inflation. These are long periods of time over the course of the last decade. And secondly, you could come to the conclusion that monetary policy in isolation is insufficient for the ECB to comply with its mandate over the last few years. There's been some very uh, enlightening moments where the ECB has been trying to get gro growth going, but has failed to actually achieve that mandate. The other question I wanted to ask you is about a, a concentration in the financial sector. The ECB has been very concerned about the fragmentation of the financial system in Europe. 
and there's been some developments in the uh, Portuguese financial sector where there's been efforts to try and promote concentration within the banking sector. I wanted to know what you think about this, because in these concerns we're hearing from the ECB, it seems that the lessons of the crisis are not being drawn, particularly the lessons about the dangerous dimensions of certain banks. Yes, uh, um, thank you for these very interesting questions, and uh, uh, I will uh, address them in turn. On the first one, on the strategic review, <clears throat> uh, I think that President Lagarde yesterday clarified that um, the review will be uh, performed in a comprehensive way and in an open-minded uh, fashion, and it will take all the elements of uh, monetary policy uh, in con into consideration, um, the uh, environment in which monetary policy operates, the structure of the economy, the international uh, 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 economic and financial uh, landscape, and this will uh, all be considered in the uh, uh, monetary policy strategic uh, review. Um, I don't know how comprehensive the review could be, but uh, I don't think that it could go as far as to consider what fiscal policy should do, of course, because fiscal, fiscal policy is clearly outside the responsibility of the ECB. It is for the uh, 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 elected bodies to decide on uh, fiscal uh, policy. Um, you got the impression that the e e ECB has been calling for restrictive policies in the past. Um, I think that President Draghi and also President Lagarde, uh, when necessary, have called, as it has been the case in uh, recent weeks, for uh, different policies, different fiscal policies, expansionary fiscal policies. They have been calling for uh, member states who have a fiscal pace to use that fiscal pace to flank monetary policy in bringing the euro area back to, uh, back to uh, price stability and uh, in order to do this, to stimulate uh, uh, domestic demand, also moving the fiscal lever. So uh, my impression is that when necessary, the ECB has called for policies that you are right, are different over time, and in each case there was a motivation why ECB has called for fiscal policies in the past and why now it is uh, uh, um, advocating uh, uh, expansionary policies by those states who have uh, uh, fiscal pays and also uh, calling on other states, other member states which do not have a fiscal pace to review, for example, the composition of their fiscal uh, uh, expenditures to have a more growth-friendly uh, 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 composition of expenditure. Um, there's no restrictive bias in my perception. There is a bias towards growth and price stability, and this has been the guiding principles uh, in the public debate which has been engaged by the ECB with the political uh, uh, authorities uh, over time. Uh, on uh, <clears throat> uh, fragmentation, and uh, I think there are two uh, dimensions here. One is fragmentation across countries in the euro area, and this clearly is something that we should not have. This is not uh, uh, a, mm, uh, a situation in which monetary policy could operate smoothly. If there's fragmentation, the monetary impulses could uh, reach different parts of the uh, uh, union in a different way, and this is something which uh, uh, should not happen, and the ECB has been uh, uh, acting to uh, avoid the fragmentation of the uh, European banking and monetary market uh, in uh, uh, recent years by intervening, and we have seen the effects of those policies. Uh, for example, the dispersion of uh, bank lending rates, of bank deposit rates, of uh, uh, repo rates in the uh, <coughs> secondary markets uh, uh, has decreased substantially, which is an indication that fragmentation after we the the increase in fragmentation which uh, uh, we have seen after the financial crisis has uh, decreased uh, uh, remarkably and now the ECB is uh, providing its monetary impulses to the entire uh, euro area. The too big to fail is an issue of course. Uh, there are uh, um, supervisory uh, and uh, uh, resolution uh, um, uh, rules which have been introduced on how to uh, address the too big to fail uh, problem. Uh, 
the, the underlying philosophy is that now there should be no bank that is too big to fail, and this is the challenge for resolution. Resolution has been designed in order to address the issue of the too big to fail banks. Uh, the framework, of course, has not been, and I say fortunately, and I hope it will never be, tested because we did not have the resolution of a large systemic uh, intermediary. Uh, but the framework is there, the concern is there, you are right, this is a problem on how to address it. You know, we have now the BRD framework which uh, aims at addressing uh, exactly this uh, problem. Thank you very much. And now Mr. Matuscello for EPP. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I won't repeat the uh, considerations that my colleagues have already made about the uh, proposal. Of course, the uh, uh, Bank of Italy has always been a hotbed of talent for our country. But I would come back to some of the comments uh, that the, uh, the other colleagues have made about what an excellent CV you have. Now, there's been an announcement of uh, 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 basically layoffs in the banking sector that by 2023 will have thousands and thousands of layoffs, closures of branches. This is affecting other, many countries, Italy, Austria, Germany. Italy is going to be particularly uh, affected by the, uh, the layoff plans that have been announced. Now, what do you think about the future of banks? Will it be moving in a more digital direction? Will that mean that more and more jobs will be lost in the sector? What do you think we can do to intervene to prevent a huge uh, loss of employment in the sector? Well, th th thank you, Mr. Matuscello. Well, on, on, uh, of course, I would not comment on uh, individual intermediaries. Uh, I uh, don't even know, frankly speaking, the plan which has been announced yesterday by Unicredit, but uh, I can imagine that uh, they are restructuring their activity like many other banks in response to the technological shock which is hitting the banking sector. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I'm also not surprised, although I'm sorry for that, that the main uh, burden would be on uh, employees in Italy because the bank is headquartered in Italy and most of its employees are in, in Italy. Um, we are now in a transition. We are in a transition from the uh, traditional way of uh, doing commercial banking to the new structure of the banking system uh, after the technological uh, 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 wave which uh, is uh, now uh, emerging. Uh, as I said before, uh, Banks are now facing a very fierce competition by non-bank intermediaries. Uh, there are estimates that uh, in the next uh, five to ten years, uh, up to 60% of the uh, revenues from retail banking will be under the threat of the competition by fintech companies. And in this landscape, it is natural to expect that banks will review uh, uh, the uh, capital labor ratio by reducing labor, by increasing uh, their recourse to technology. And this, uh, of course, would have some advantages for the banks, for the public at large, because this will enable banks to offer banking services at lower cost in a more efficient uh, way and more secure services. Of course, this has a social cost, which is always the case when you are in a transition from one equilibrium to the other. We are now in this phase. Um, I would say that uh, uh, the, uh, in many countries, uh, including Italy, uh, banks have a sort of self-insurance. They are providing funds to uh, smooth the exit of the employees and their uh, early retirement. And this is the case, for example, for Italy and also other Euro area countries. This is a problem that we have to cope with, but we cannot stop this technological innovation, this wave of innovation, because in the end, we will have a much more efficient uh, system which will provide 
cheaper and uh, more efficient services to the real economy at large, households and uh, uh, corporations, especially uh, small companies. Because uh, up to now, uh, most of the uh, 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 fixed costs and the inefficiencies of the banking system do fall on the shoulders of smaller companies, and this uh, transition will uh, improve the situation and the funding conditions for small uh, and medium enterprises, and this is a welcome development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now our last uh, question from uh, Evelyn Regner from SND. Uh, thank you, Schön. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be speaking in German. It's 2019, and if we look at the ECB and the executive board, we see uh, that uh, we don't have gender balance on uh, the board. Four uh, men and two women, and uh, the uh, uh, woman who will be leaving should be replaced by another. Now, it, it's uh, uh, something that has been said often that this should not continue. And uh, uh, you didn't uh, uh, give that much detail on that uh, in your presentation. Uh, can you just tell us what the plan is for gender equality? What do you think uh, can be done at the ECB? You talked about the uh, example of Banco d'Italia. And how do you see that happening in a European context? And in my uh, introduction and in my answers to the questionnaire, I tried to give you a sense of uh, what uh, I did and what I can do as a board member of a central bank. I'm now board member of the uh, Central Bank of Italy, and in this role, I have taken uh, into account and taken care of the uh, necessity to have diversity within the bank, diversity on many dimensions, in particular, uh, in uh, uh, terms of gender balance. I tried to give you uh, an idea of which measures could be taken by an organization to uh, have a, a better gender balance. And uh, um, the example of the Bank of Italy was uh, not because I considered this uh, you know, more important than other examples, because this is what I've been part of. I've been part of the uh, management of a complex organization with uh, 8,000 employees in which we had a very poor, very unsatisfactory gender balance when uh, we took office, we, we realized that this was not uh, something which uh, we did like, and we tried to improve uh, the situation. And I gave you the uh, intermediate results that we have obtained in the uh, uh, recent years, the years in which I was in the board. On the <clears throat> uh, and of course, I, I will uh, uh, do the same uh, if uh, and when I will be appointed in the executive board of the uh, European Central Bank. On the problem of the composition of the board, uh, it's not up to me to, I have no possibility to uh, influence the way in which the member states uh, 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 do their nominations. I have no uh, possibility to influence the way in which uh, member states appoint the central bank governors. I think that uh, it is in the interest of everybody to have a balanced gender composition of any board, of any body. Uh, but unfortunately, I cannot take any commitment for the governors and from the other board members. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank my uh, colleagues. I thank uh, Mr. Uh, Panetta. The uh, hearing ends here. And uh, now we can... Uh, continue. Uh, we we'll take a couple of minutes break to allow uh, the next.